um, now I'm going to talk about uh, EIA case uh, uh, in Bangalore. So, uh, environmental impact assessment notification, the 2006 uh, version, it was adopted by Department of Environment, Ecology and Environment uh, by the Karnataka State Pollution Control Board. It made domestic polluters responsible. So, under that, whenever you're proposing a building or a construction uh, establishment, uh, either commercial or techno park or residential, you have to take a consent which is known as consent mechanism. You have to take a consent from different authorities to establish that particular establishment. And in that consent, you have to clearly state that how you're going to manage your pollution. Solid waste, liquid waste, and if you are producing any air pollution. So that was there in the building plan approval. Earlier, it was not part of building plan approval. So the key components within domestic drilling were that zero liquid discharge. Each and every property establishment has to maintain zero liquid discharge. And to maintain the zero liquid discharge, to motivate people to use recycled, uh, to recycle the sewage, treated sewage, they made environmental standard very stringent. It's like below 10 uh, milligram per liter of BOD. It's like, okay, it's, if, it, if it's clean, then people are going to be use it for their toilets and for, for flushing or for recycling in their gardens. So consent mechanism involves a lot of agencies. Sometimes it can go up to 10 to 15 multiple agencies. So they have to take approval from Karnataka State Pollution Control Board, uh, Development Authorities, BBMP, which is their municipality. And this particular example of EIA actually comes under command and control approach. As you see, are you able to see this diagram? So there are different dimensions of law. Most of the laws in India, they fall under reactive category. As in where we want to decide the norms, we want to decide the standards, and we want to, it's, it's kind of a vigilance. We, it's, it doesn't promote, uh, uh, you know, proactive actions. It just, you regulate something. You're just regulating, you're just holding a stick, okay, you do this thing, you do this thing. So which doesn't give that sense of ownership that you want to do something for your, you know, your uh, country or your state or your city. It always comes from the top down approach that we think that you need to maintain your water bodies. Okay, so this EIA regulation comes under reactive type of law, which, have, which is a command and control approach and it follows certain norms, consent and standards. So, um, the uh, adoption of EIA, why Bangalore chose to adopt this particular EIA, there was a twofold uh, uh, motive behind this thing. Bangalore was experiencing, was experiencing a lot of urbanization and unplanned urbanization because of IT sector, because of other kind of uh, employment opportunities that it was providing. And because of that, the uh, Bangalore Water Sewerage Board, that was not able to provide uh, water and wastewater services to the peripheral region. That led to uh, untreated waste going into the storm drain drains and the lakes that the Bangalore has. So that kind of, uh, to reduce the burden on BWSSB, which is Bangalore Water and Sewerage Board, Karnataka State Pollution Control Board uh, thought of implementing this EIA 2006. Under this, um, certain properties of 20,000 square meter of build-up area, they were supposed to have their own solid waste management unit and liquid waste management unit. This led to a mixed model, as I said. So in Bangalore currently, at least in 2015, they, they had centralized systems 14 and decentralized system about 3,000 functional unit. The number is higher when you go to the records. There are around 6,000 units, decentralized units, but out of that only 3,000 are currently operational and functional on maintaining certain kind of uh, standards. Uh, this I've already spoken about that how it is to deal with the growing population, geographical expansion and burden on the current water supply and uh, sanitation infrastructure. So um, when I studied this case, I came to understand that it is achieving somewhat uh, better operational efficiency with respect to pollution treatment. So I compared centralized systems with the decentralized system. What I came to know is that centralized systems are not able to achieve, they are not even able to function at a 25% of what they are supposed to function. While decentralized systems were able to function, achieve some, some kind of an 
uh, efficiency. Secondly, they were reaching to unserved population, that which was there in the peripheral region. Centralized systems were not reaching, so at least that they were addressing that particular region. Secondly, it, uh, thirdly, it reduced certain burden on public util utilities. Now, BWSS, BWSSB doesn't have to you know, reach to these areas, so they can uh, focus on other uh, more important aspects. And there was some degree of recycle and reuse was happening for a larger um, units, like big techno parks, they are there in Bangalore peripheral region, and for them, uh, there is no BWSSB supply, there is no public water supply, or even if it's there, it's very limited. So they make use of this treated sewage and they kind of at least use it for non-portable purposes like flushing and irrigating and irrigation purposes. So for them, this model was useful. For them, this model was working even, even though it was slightly expensive for them. Because as I discussed here, yesterday, sanitation tax is very low in Indian cities, most of the Indian cities. So at least even though they were paying extra amount under this model, they were able to recover it through recycling uh, the sewage. So th this was useful for the bigger establishment, but not for the smaller establishments. Um, so these were the key challenges. As I mentioned yesterday, when you have so many decentralized units, you need to, government need to have that kind of resources to monitor so many uh, 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 such kind of units. So KSPCB is currently dealing with that resource mismatch. You have 6,000 units and if you go to um, Bangalore, I think Bangalore has four regional offices in Karnataka state, uh, in, in, in Bangalore itself. Uh, and those regional offices has one environmental engineer, senior environmental engineer. They are supposed to frequently visit these units, decentralized units, at least monthly once. They are not even able to do that. That is a kind of a crunch mismatch is there between the resources required and resources um, um, they have. And KSPCB doesn't have any real power. And why I say so? So KSPCB uh, at most or any state pollution control board at most what they can do, they can file a criminal case against the uh, who is, who, whoever is a defaulter in pollution management. So what they did was they filed a case, criminal case against BWSSB which is another government agency. So they filed a criminal case against BWSSB. There are 18 cases running since 2006 and nothing has been done after those cases. So the maximum they can do is just uh, file a criminal case. And second thing what they can do which is kind of understood as a administrative power, they can ask uh, local authorities, local utilities to cut electricity or to cut uh, water supply to certain industries or commercial properties. But these two measures are not applicable for domestic users because water and electricity is considered as a basic services. So you can't cut uh, these two services if a domestic um, um, person or domestic like polluter is defaulter. Then you can't do these things. And then they have different measurements like uh, I would like to draw your attention on the ZLD com compliance. The zero liquid discharge was not working as I said for smaller units. It was very expensive for them to manage. Residential units they had to because as I said this was a command and control approach so they had to establish these systems otherwise building plan approval was not possible. So they made the capital investment in these units but ultimately when it comes to maintaining and you know recovering the ONM cost they were not able to. So most of these systems, 6,000 were there, only 3,000 are working. And the, out of these 3,000, only few are able to recycle or do the zero liquid discharge because the demand is very low for the recyclable water. They are not even allowed to sell to another party so that they can make some money out of it. So these are the certain policy recommendations that people are now making that at least allow us to sell our treated sewage so that we can make some money out of it. And also this model doesn't include slums. So centralized model anyway slums are not part of it because uh, slums do not have land tenure. So you can get connected to centralized system only if you have a um, kind of a land tenure. Like if only if you own certain land. Household connection can happen only then. And obviously decentralized systems are also not meant for slums. So slums were anyways part are not part of centralized system or decentralized system. So poor were anyways excluded from uh, either the two models. 
So if you have any question, I can take one or two questions regarding this case study. Then otherwise I can move to next case study. So uh, with this case, what has happened that, uh, so yes, the point that I have missed here is uh, this point, uh, information asymmetry. So what has happened that buildings are made by builders. Okay. And then even the such kind of systems like solid waste management system or liquid waste management system, these are established by the builders. The buyers, potential buyers like me or you, if we, if we want to buy a flat in that particular building complex, we are not aware of the expected or potential cost. Okay, so when it comes to our hands, building operator, builders, actually builders are uh, supposed to maintain these systems for 5 years such kind of solid waste and liquid waste system. After five years, they are supposed to hand over the system to resident welfare association. But because we are not part of the decision making of which technology is appropriate, which technology do we want, how much do we, uh, you know, can we really pay the ONM cost for these technologies because we are not part of that selection process, we are not aware of that. So ultimately when it comes to us, we don't want to manage that. It's too much of a burden for them. In terms of, you know, it's better to pay a very minimal sanitation tax to the government than maintaining our entire facility on our own. It's very expensive for them, at least for the smaller uh, residential units or smaller units. Uh, now I'm going to talk about national urban sanitation policy. Why this policy is important is that it's the first ever policy that concerns urban sanitation. Before that, before 2008, we never had uh, any policy concerning urban sanitation. Okay, and it provides national goals on sanitation. That means it links the SDGs and MDGs with the national level goals. Uh, it connects sanitation with health and environment, which I told you that sanitation was used to be part of health. And in 2008, NUSP again made that connect that sanitation should be linked with the public health. Then only you will be able to improve sanitation goals or achieve sanitation goals. It questioned the sustainability of centralized systems. That why, as I said, the centralized system cannot connect to the slums because they don't have land, land tenure. Centralized systems are too expensive to be managed by smaller cities. As I mentioned yesterday, they can't have, they don't have the required capital and the capacities. So centralized systems are actually failed to resolve equity issues and environmental sustainability issues. So NUSP questions the sustainability of such centralized imagination in context of sanitation. And then it recommends certain um, things which cities sh should adopt over a period of time. It said that currently sanitation doesn't have any institutional hope. So when you talk about sanitation, sanitation doesn't fit into any of the categories. Rural sanitation has a ministry. Urban sanitation doesn't have any ministry. It comes under some urban development, this thing. And even ULBs, if you go at the state level, in some cities, ULBs are managing sanitation. In some states, it's sewerage board that are man managing, uh, you know, sanitation. So it's like different components of sanitation are being managed by different agencies, even at the state and city level. Slum sanitation is be being managed by slum development board. Uh, cities are being managed by water sewerage board. So they want it that who's ultimately responsible for sanitation. So NUSP said that you want to have an institutional hope and it said that ULPs should be the nodal agency to manage uh, sanitation. And it said that you need to establish uh, city sanitation task force. So they understood that sanitation policies or sanitation solutions should be developed bottom up rather than top down. Because when you go to top down, you just go for the centralized imagination. And each city, as you're going to, I think uh, today we're going to talk about it, LAP itself has a very heterogeneous pockets. So there are certain pockets which has higher sanitation infrastructure and good practices. There are certain pockets where sanitation infrastructure is very poor and the practices are very poor. So at city level, you need to adopt rather than one size fit all solution, which is centralized solution, you need to have heterodox model of sanitation where you choose technical options based on the, those heterogeneous pockets. So that's how the NUSP said that you have to make city sanitation plans according to your need, according to whatever your, the pockets are there, and according to your capacity, which is your institutional capacity, your technical capacity, and your financial capacity. Otherwise, how it happens is that each city, irrespective of 
their finances, they want to adopt centralized systems. So NUSP said that you have to adopt different models according to your need and capacity. So then what I did was to understand if NUSP recommendation ultimately you know, uh, kind of translated on ground in with respect to cities. So I studied few city sanitation plans. Um, this process started in 2011. We have 134 city sanitation plans. And out of that, I could manage to lay my hands on only 31 CSPs because others were not available in public domain. And out of that, I studied around 27 CSPs. And I studied these CSPs to understand if how many recommendations of NUSPs are actually are part of CSPs. So what I understood or what I learned from the, this study is that CSP, actually all the CSPs they adopted centralized system. The CSPs were very bad documents. All these CSPs were more of a, what do you say, project reports rather than a plan. They were not plans, they were just projects report made by some consultant drawing upon secondary data, whatever old data, 2011, 2010, 2008 data, and they sat there for two months and made a CSP. So there was no participation, there was no consultation workshops, it was just a, a formality to draw funds from the center and the state. So CSPs were not actually participative documents at all. So that's what we understood over there. And But then I wanted to understand that why cities adopted centralized option, why they didn't go for the decentralized option even when there was an opportunity for them to plan. So what I understood was that there was policy centralization. I don't know how many of you understand this thing, but when you say policy centralization, it means that policy is being affected by the top-down model. They were at different steps, CSP formation, CSP content was affected by other actors, not just the ULBs. So like first thing was, they, it was a consultant driven process. So even though ULBs were supposed to develop these CSPs, the consultants were decided at MOUD level. ULBs were not even allowed to choose their own consultant for developing CSPs. So there was a policy centralization happening there. So it was a chunk kind of a thing where MOUD gave contract to one big agency and, MOU, and that particular agency had to establish uh, CSPs for 21 cities. So when you see, when you compare all these CSPs, all CSPs will look copy paste documents. Only the name of city is changed or maybe certain uh, the data is changed. Otherwise same language is there same everything, everything is similar. So it shows that how much consultant can sit for two months and can equally like can easily prepare 11 CSP in one go. It was so easy for them. And then where is the you know participate process there? And the second thing which they said was that why they didn't adopt decentralized option, they said that we already have big money coming under JNNURM. Decentralization is this, you need small money, small pockets. Centralization means that we have big money which is already there with JNNURM. Why do we want to adopt decentralized options? So this was the second reason. Third reason was uh, service level benchmarks. Uh, service level benchmarks, have you heard of these service level benchmarks? So these are the service level benchmarks that are given by Ministry of Urban Development in water supply and sewerage and solid waste management. So these, if you see these service level benchmarks, they are, they don't consider, they are not based on city size or city population. These are based on that every city has to reach to 100% level of sewerage network. Every city has to have 100% collection. Every city has to have 100% you know, disposal rate. But when you see, each, set, each city is very specific. Each city has their own problems, their own issues and own strengths. But this model actually advocates that every city has to have a one-size-fits-all solution. So when you compare these norms with the previous norms which were given by Zakira Committee, which was given by CPHEEO, which were given by uh, nine five-year plan, those are very differential, uh, differential kind of standards. 
in which they acknowledge that if a city is of 1 lakh population, they have to have only 70 LPCD water supply. If the city is of bigger size, they might want to have 120 LPCD. In this case, every city has to have a 150 LPCD, every city has to have, you know, 24 hours 7 of water supply, every city has to have a 100% sewage network. So this differentiality and the concept that every city has their own problems, or own needs, own capacity, that was not acknowledged in, in this SLBs. Okay, in case of liquid waste management, there are two types of standards that they are talking about. They said that every city has to have a 100% sewerage network. Okay, but within that, there are two things that, that are there. You can reach this 100% sewerage network either a centralized way or decentralized way. But when I saw these, when I reviewed these CSPs, most of the cities kind of ignored this factor that you can achieve 100% sewerage by combining both the model. So there comes that even the cities, they don't want to adopt decentralized model. So it is not just the SLBs. It is just that they don't want to adopt decentralized model. And what is, promo what is promoting them or what is promoting pushing cities towards service level benchmarks of 100% is the fact that SLBs are actually under 13th Finance Commission are linked to, are linked to fund release. So when something is linked to fund release, you have to show that you want to achieve 100% of everything because that's how you're going to get funds from the center. If you're going to say, oh, I'll just have decentralized system and that we'll see how it works, who's going to give you funds for that? Okay, so this is one factor as she said that there is an ambiguity in this SLBs and when there is ambiguous policy or the open policy or all inclusive policies, every actor can choose to interpret that particular policy the way they want. So the policy can swing either ways, wherever you want it suitable thing. So that is one thing which is there in the SLB implementation at city level. Uh, in Alibag, what we try to do is that we try to develop sanitation zones. I, I think we mentioned about that. So in sanitation zones, you divide zones according to their infrastructure practices and future needs. So that is how CSPs were expected to uh, made, but that didn't happen. What they did, they gave a very brief introduction, da 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 da, these are the status, this is the problems and in the end, oh we need so many big projects. That was the city sanitation plan, which even I can do. So what is the need of having, you know, a participative institution like having a city sanitation task force? where you have representative from public health department, from sanitation, from solid waste. So all these things were not reflected in any of the CSPs, where they like, like you can clearly see the linkages between proposed solution and how it improves public health. So you can see that these documents are just copy paste from one to another to second to third and just city name is changing and some um, this thing are changing, data is changing. 